Welcome to episode 76 of the Tactics Meeting. Today's guest is Ron Holcomb, retired from the Department of Ecology as a responder and wrote his book, Constant Chaos, outlining his experiences responding to all manner of disasters within the state of Washington. It's going to be a great show, so stick around. This episode of the Tactics Meeting is brought to you in part by Gallagher Marine Systems. Gallagher Marine Systems is the industry's most comprehensive source of full-service, in-depth compliance support. And by individual supporters like you, who give us $5 a month to help us pay the expenses of putting on this great show every single week. If you like the show, if you get something out of it, jump on over to our Patreon page, give us a small monthly contribution, we would really appreciate it. Now let's get to this amazing episode. Well, it's time for the tactics meeting, the program where we talk to subject matter experts about response, tactics, and technology. I'm your host, Dan Smiley, and today on the program, I'm excited to have Ron Holcomb, author of Constant Chaos, The Daily Battle to Protect the Environment. And Ron, welcome to the program. Dan, thank you uh, for having me on. Pleasure to be here. It was a, it was a, it's fun and a little freaky to read your book because I was personally at a number of the oil spill response incidents that you talk about, the Delco Passage, the uh, Olympic Pipeline uh, spill and fire, uh, others, um, but kind of cool to see a, a different perspective. But before we talk about some of those incidents, which I think everybody should read to get some background on you know what has happened before that has gotten us to the point that we're at today tell us a little about yourself and how you found yourself on the front line of oil spill response well my my journey kind of started and i i write about this in in my prologue which i've titled how i became an environmental medic um I did grow up through high school down in uh, California uh, behind the coastal mountains from Santa Barbara. And in 1969, uh, being in high school at that time, I witnessed the uh, 3 million gallon uh, Santa Barbara oil spill. That was a offshore platform that, that blew out. And at the time it was the largest oil spill in the United States. And it had quite an impact on me. My friends and I were surfers and, you know, we spent a lot of time at the beach and it was uh, quite uh, horrific to see the uh, this large oil spill. So that kind of set me on a on a track that uh, would uh, get me through college and uh, then graduate school where I got a master of science in environmental communication. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Humboldt State University in Northern California, and then graduate school at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And that uh, allowed me to kind of join the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for my first job. And, and I missed the ocean and the mountains quite a bit. So in 1980, I uh, was able to get a job with the Department of Ecology uh, here in Olympia. And I started as a public information officer uh, with the state. And one of my duties became uh, supporting the very kind of new uh, spill program. And so I became essentially kind of the spokesperson for ecology at uh, kind of major oil spills. And I, I write about a few of those um, in that capacity. Uh, that I think were, were really uh, important uh, historical moments in, in the state's environmental history. However, I did something uh, different. Mo a lot of people go from the field to the office uh, as they go through their careers. And, and I did the opposite. I, I went from, from being in the public information uh, end of things, and uh, I enjoyed uh, working with the spill responders on the spills. And I eventually became one. And in 1994, I uh, joined the Southwest Ecology Southwest Region Spill uh, team. 
and I stayed there through uh, my retirement in 2020. That's quite a while. You're right. I went from the field to the office because, you know, I'm getting old and dragging boom around on the beaches and stacking it back on boats and into trailers is just uh, more than I've got in my bag these days. So, well, the book is great. Um, I enjoyed reading your take on Nastucca, which was a Sauce Brothers barge that um, uh, ended up spilling oil off the mouth of Gray's Harbor. And this bill predates Exxon Valdez. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that incident and how you came to be involved? Yes. Um, so there had been a couple of big spills before that. There had been, a, the, I think, the uh, SS Mobile Oil on the Columbia River had nearly a 200,000 gallon spill. And, and then in 1985, the Anco, uh, Arco Anchorage spill in, uh, in oh, Port Angeles, uh, Port Angeles yep. happened. And those first kind of two spills is where, you know, this is early incident command system. And, and so there had been a little bit of incident command system during those two spills, but the Nastucca was really, in my experience, was the first time we really kind of really got, you know, a well-organized unified command system together between the, the Coast Guard, Federal OSC, Ecologies OSC. And then, of course, we had the responsible party, uh, Sauce Brothers Ocean uh, towing, which, you know, uh, Dick Lauer was great during that and uh, was all over the place, uh, directly involved in that. But that spill, if we want to go back to it, the uh, the Sauce Brothers tug, the Ocean Service, 120 foot tug was towing the 300 foot uh, oil barge in a stuck. It, it had left the BP refinery up in Ferndale loaded with uh, nearly 3 million gallons of, of Bunker C heavy fuel oil. And on the evening of December 22nd, 1988, a couple days before Christmas, it was coming into Gray's Harbor. It had a stop there. It was really headed to Portland, but it had a stop in Gray's Harbor. And as the the tug was making the turn and, and coming into the channel. It was shortening the tow line. And during that, the tow line snapped and broke and, and the Nastucca uh, barge was, you know, free and floating around. It uh, was a bit stormy. It's winter, you know, swells 14, 16 feet, you know, pretty good wind. The barge started drifting towards the north jetty and the there are many interesting parts of this story um, one of them is sauce brothers ocean towing uh, uh, developed and patented a barge retrieval uh, system called the orville hook and they had it on board, but unfortunately, the captain of the tug was the only one on board that night that was trained and knew how to use it. And he didn't feel he had time to get this untrained crew to get, get it out, deployed to try to reconnect re, uh, the barge. So as they saw it drifting towards the jetty, he made a very valiant effort backing the tug at an angle to the barge to have two crewmen jump aboard and then in an effort to try to get the an emergency tow line attached. Um, the barge didn't have an emergency tow line trailing from it, but I think partially maybe because they had the Orville hook and if there was a, a problem, they would use that. Anyway, in the swells and stuff, the, the tug rammed into the, into the barge and hold a, a cargo compartment and had a gash about seven feet long, 18 inches wide. And they didn't know it in the dark at the time, but oil started coming off. Two crew members were able to get on board and, 
and their radio was shorted out by water. And so they had no communication and they didn't even have time to put on survival suits. So it was a very tenuous situation. What happened was the, the, the barges, uh, tow bridle and cable started dragging on the shallower, um, sediment or the bottom and it and it stopped before it hit the jetty which was great they, they got the orville hooked out and deployed they had time and they reattached it but when they hit the when they hit the barge with the tug they damaged the rudder so they were you know in in kind of difficult uh position so they they called for help and there was another tug nearby the janet r and when they arrived on scene, and this is about 2 a.m., they saw that oil was leaking from the, the barge. And so at that point, they contacted the captain, who then notified the Coast Guard. And then, of course, that's how ecology got in. But one of the key points of this incident is the, the tug captain said to the Coast Guard when I talked to him, you know, it's too dangerous um, I don't have good steerage. You know, we've got an emergency tow line. I, I, I don't think it is good to come into Grace Harbor. I'm going to go out to sea in a southeasterly or southwesterly direction um, out towards off the mouth of the Columbia River because they were going to have to go to Portland uh, anyway. And that made sense. And but later became a, a, a critical point when we get Canada involved. So anyway, they they headed out to uh, to see, and then all the notifications were made, including ecology, and and that's how the the incident started. So she goes offshore, and that puts the oil offshore enough that it puts it in, you know, it allows it in the prevailing currents to head towards Vancouver Island, right? It's uh, it's now moving up the coast. But if he'd gone in, it would have spilled all throughout Grace Harbor. So that's not a great choice either. And and that was one of the one of the considerations uh, is is you know Bowerman Basin inside Grace Harbor is one of the major migratory uh, bird stops and, and you know there are just a lot of environmentally sensitive areas uh, in there um, that was a concern but I think it was more the captain worried of the narrow channel and and not having control of his. Uh, tug uh, very much in the emergency tow line that something more could go wrong in that and it just felt safer in the Coast Guard and everybody agreed that that was the right call to make. Now the oil of course did did come ashore in the winter time the near shore currents move in a northerly direction and one of the things we learned unfortunately that was kind of a difficult uh, thing uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration provides uh, a person to the Coast Guard called the Scientific Support Coordinator, and you know that's an expert. They go all around the world um, assisting on oil spills. They were the in charge, or, or mostly in charge, with state and and others who would go on overflights to track the oil. As the oil was moving north, it seemed to be getting less and less. So the reports back to the unified command was that, you know, this is looking like the oil's dissipating and we're hoping we're not going to have major uh, shoreline impacts north of the ocean shores area, which was hit pretty hard. And, and those were the easy beaches to clean on the sand where you could get vehicles and workers right, right in there. So New Year's Eve, a storm hit. And what happened was it slammed the oil to shore in the Olympic uh, National Park wilderness beaches. And then later it moved north and hit um, Vancouver Island in Canada. And, and what we, we learned was this heavy oil was just kind of just a little bit subsurface as it was, you know, I guess weathering a little bit, but just getting heavier. So it just wasn't as visible from the air. And that really threw uh, everybody and, and uh, you know, 
extended the cleanup considerably and, you know, uh, got into Canada. And that's where this decision to take the barge out to sea came in because the Canadians in the media, it be, you know, and for some reason they blamed ecologies, uh, SOSC for the decision because we're the environmental agency that, that it was ecology that, you know, directed the tug and, and the barge to go out to sea. So we, we kind of caught were unfairly uh, uh, criticized uh, and, and that was a hard thing to, to, to turn on, but that was kind of part of my job because I was a public information. I was the main spokesperson for, for the incident uh, during that time. Yeah, because directing, you know, uh, vessel movements, that clearly falls within the jurisdiction of the captain of the port. That's the Coast Guard, not not ecology. Right, I mean, so that's you, why... You could uh, order the barge offshore and he could go, he could... Uh, he could do it. He could not do it. You, there's really nothing you can do about it. Uh, I know, but it's so hard. Once something like that starts, um, it, it, it was hard to turn. And, you know, we dealt with it as best we could. And, of course, Sauce Brothers was, was great. You know, we sent team up there to collect a sample and sent it to the lab and confirmed that it was the Nastuka and, and Sauce Brothers, you know, hired cleanup contractors up there and and, you know, uh, did everything they, they could to deal with the spill in Canada and in the United States uh, or in, in Washington. Another thing Sauce Brothers did, well, yeah, they did a number of things. They hired Global Diving uh, and Salvage for the, the shoreline cleanup. And they, they were awesome. Uh, Tom Davis uh, actually perfected something from that spill which, uh, you know, is now something used worldwide. They had these oil snares, which, you know, look like cheerleader pom-poms that are very good for collecting heavy oil. Well, at the time, they were just these single, you know, oil snares. Well, they did some tests and they, they started tying them onto ropes and in a string and then um, would leave them out through tidal changes um, so they were staked out and wouldn't float away. And, you know, they were, you know, very effective. And, you know, you know, those are used all the time on, on heavy oil spills. I know we use it for the rest of my career. You know, it's amazing. Another yeah, thing now when you buy them, they come on the rope, right? You right, have to put yeah. them on a rope. That's how you get them. Right. And each one, you know, collected a, like a, sometimes up to a gallon and a half or, or so of, uh, of oil, you know, they're very effective on, on heavy oil. The other thing Sauce Brothers did was they hired Alice Berkner out of California, the International Bird Rescue Research Center. And, and she at the time was pretty much the world's expert on cleaning oil birds and found that Dawn soap was the, the most effective soap to use. Although, you know, people had to be trained on how to handle the birds, you know, because the birds, you know, are stressed and they're, uh, they can peck at people. So, so the bird washing and re rehabilitation is a really tricky system. And she came up and, and ran the operation under the kind of the overall guidance of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because they're responsible for migratory birds. Uh, and common MERS were the most uh, impacted uh, bird species. And, and that went on uh, for weeks. And then when the Exxon Valdez spill uh, happened. She went, went up there and oversaw the, the bird uh, cleaning rehabilitation uh, operation up there. I did a podcast with uh, International Bird Rescue, and I, I did another one with Focus Wildlife as well. So if people are interested in learning more about uh, the wildlife branch and how the cleanup is, and really the story of how the whole Dawn Soap thing uh, came about, I, I refer them to those podcasts. I guess uh, she was looking for something that that was effective, but was also uh, readily available, preferably anywhere in the world. And apparently Dawn Soap, marketed under many different names, is available in Canada and the United States and Mexico and Europe and Brazil. I mean, it's you can buy it everywhere, um, just under a different name. So you... If you fly into Brazil and you're doing a wildlife cleanup, you can get the supplies you need at, at the grocery store and the hardware store, right? To get to get going, and so that that was the uh, that was the story there. Let's talk about Canada 
and what how the Canadians reacted to this oil coming from the United States and impacting those their beaches and what uh, what you know the international relations were in regard to the response. Yeah, obviously, they, you know, it was clear from news reports and, and other things, you know, they, they were hopping mad. And obviously, that went up to the highest level. And uh, our governor at the time, Booth Gardner, then uh, connected with the uh, premier of British Columbia. And they essentially uh, formed what started as the Washington British Columbia oil spill task force. And uh, the di ecology director at the time was um, Christine Gregoire. She was in her first year as ecology director. And, and this was quite the learning experience for her. And she's a very quick uh, learner. And then of course the, the task force came down to ecology and, and uh, Chris, and that started, you know, cross-border meetings. We went to Victoria for the, the very first one. And literally, uh, that was in March, the day after that first meeting of the, of the oil spill task force, the Exxon Valdez uh, accident uh, happened. And the, the task force later, and because of the Exxon Valdez uh, Part of the story, I don't know, a lot of people know, um, Exxon wanted to bring the Valdez uh, initially to Portland, to the shipyard in Portland. And that got us involved because we do have very strong water quality laws um, in Washington, especially for oil. So the fact that the, the you know, the, the ship would probably be sheening still even, you know, after the voyage down there, um, we worked, ecology worked with Oregon to come up with requirements uh, that they would have to meet to bring the ship up the Columbia River. And I think they felt the requirements were a little too much. So they decided not to come to Portland. They took it to California instead. Yeah, I think they went to Long Beach and when she came back out again, she was the Exxon Mediterranean. No more Exxon Valdez, right? And she was banned right. from ever going back into Alaska, like it was the ship's fault, right? But right. yeah, she never. And the other thing about the the task force and the Exxon Valdez and all that, the, the task force grew to include um, Oregon, California, and then later uh, Hawaii and. That uh, group is still uh, active to this day, uh, working on uh, efforts to, you know, try to uh, for spill prevention, preparedness, and response. Another incident that you go into in significant detail in the book is the uh, Olympic pipeline. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it explosion, but the the spill and and fire that that resulted that that event uh, resulted in in three deaths and shut that section of the pipeline down, cutting off refined product from the BP refinery at Cherry Point and the refinery in Ferndale. And I think it was Tosco at the time, but that refinery has changed hands so many times I can't keep track. So uh, where were you when you first were notified of that incident and how did you respond? So that was in, uh, the, the incident happened June 10th, 1999. And just interestingly, um, the 24th an 25th anniversary of that event is, is this year. I was at that time, I was a spill responder based out of the Southwest region. And this incident happened in Bellingham, which is in ecology's Northwest region. So, so it wasn't in, in my region, but obviously it was a huge incident. And so I was assigned to the investigation team um, that, you know, ecology, uh, you know, after any uh, 
oil spill, you know, we're going to investigate because we do have uh, enforcement uh, authority in addition to response responsibilities. So I was literally up there the the, the next morning uh, at the kind of the first big official unified command meeting and uh, focusing on on the investigation. And, and I would very soon become one of the designated parties or as as ecology we were designated party to the national transportation safety boards investigation which is uh was was an interesting part of the of the incident um the ntsb is not a regulatory agency they are focused on determining the cause of incidents whether it's uh, you know an airline accident uh, you know train derailments and pipeline uh, incidents. And they determine the cause and then offer recommendations for the agencies that do regulate them. So typically they get full cooperation from a responsible party. Well, at this first unified command meeting um, that happened the day after, um, there were a couple of EPA criminal investigators that were there and as everybody was introducing themselves kind of you know that put a different look on things and as the ntsb started setting up interviews to to talk to people from olympic pipeline um you know turned out ultimately eight employees were kind of advised by their attorneys to plead the fifth and and not because of this potential criminal investigation that was also uh, going on. So that for the NTSB was a first. They'd never had that and it, and it complicated um, the investigation. Um, and instead of being kind of a one year, which is typical for them, nine months to a year, it, it took almost three because they had to do a lot of the uh, determinations by, you know, records and computer uh, printouts and stuff like that. So um, I was part of that while they were still doing the field investigation uh, interviews of people that, that they could talk to. And also when the, the pipeline after the fires had burned out and the pipeline was then excavated and um, we could see where the damage was and they cut off section and shipped it back to their uh, metal lab back in Washington, DC. And what was, if you can recall, uh, determined to be the cause? As I recall, and my memory may be faulty, that it was um, excavation that was going on, not by BP, that ultimately hit and ruptured that pipe. That's just my recollection. I don't know that that's true. What is the truth? So, so, so there were, it, it was not just one reason or cause. It, it, uh, multiple things uh, happened that led to this particular rupture. So the, the pipeline itself runs through in Bellingham through Whatcom Falls Park, a, just a beautiful area. It's a, it's a kind of an urban wilderness park. But also in the park is the city's water treatment plant. They take water from Lake Whatcom, treat it, and then distribute it to, to the city. The pipeline runs right through this area, and there's a lot of other pipes for the, the water treatment plant. So uh, the, the pipeline was put in in the you know, six, 1960s, and then there was work that was done uh, in the early 90s of putting in additional water pipelines. And so the city hired uh, contractors to come in and do that work, and they're digging around the Olympic pipelines pipe. And it's Olympic's responsibility to be there when all this work is being done because it's their pipe and you know they they want to do it unfortunately they weren't there all the time and sometime during this uh work there they hit the pipe and it and it was damaged and it wasn't reported and you know everything was covered up and but it wasn't it didn't break it was damaged no no it, it just wasn't it ruptured. just it dented it, it right. you know, which is not good. So um, later, 
Olympic pipeline did uh, send through what are called smart pigs. These are, you know, cylindrical devices that are sent through the pipeline and, and they can check for thickness and, and other things. And there was kind of dents and gouges and wrinkles and other things that were determined in this area. So this wasn't for, the first time that it had been hit. I'm sorry? So the incident that you're referring to where it was dented, maybe that wasn't the first time it had been dented. Well, don't don't know that, but it's the likely time that it was just okay. based on when what construction activities were happening around their pipeline. Anyway, they uh, when they sent through the smart pig, they identified problems there. So there's a number of, I guess, reasons. Initially, it was identified. We need to go dig it up and, and, and look at it. And when it was first on the schedule, I think it, it was the weather was bad. It was muddy or whatever. They decided not to. And then later, higher up management said, oh, it, it, you know, too much. I don't whatever. We don't want to go in there. And so they decided not. They never went in and, and looked at it. So so that was the first big thing. You've got a weakened pipe there. The next thing that contributed to it, they put a new uh, oil products terminal online um, six months before the came online six months before the accident in Bayview down in in uh, Skagit County near Mount Vernon and some things were incorrectly uh, installed there having to do with a relief valve so if uh, to to protect the the pipeline and that uh, that terminal if the pressure, I think it was uh, 650 or 750 PSI, if it hit that, a pressure relief valve was supposed to trigger and, and put product into a breakout tank that they, they had there. It never worked properly. So in the six months between when Bayview opened at the end of December of 1998 and when the incident happened in June of 1999, there, th that system didn't work properly and it caused, because the pressure relief valve didn't work properly, it caused the whole, the block valve to, to close, which completely closed down the pipeline. It happened 41 times. And when that block valve closes, when the pipeline's operating, it, you know, it sends a huge pressure wave back through the pipeline. So this happened 41 times. And they they didn't properly uh, find the problem or deal with it properly, and the and the pipeline controllers weren't trained on the new anything new with the new terminal online. So the Olympic pipeline, you know, kind of was at fault for that. On the day of the incident, the computers system they had had a problem and and messed up, and literally they had to shut it down. And in the and while this was happening, okay, number forty-two, the pipeline shut down. But this time, when it shut down, that pressure wave went back up, and that the damage in the pipe had weakened to the point where it finally ruptured. And they didn't they didn't recognize that because they, well, this is just another time that happened. So they actually, after the rupture, and it wasn't noticed at the park or anything at the time. They restarted the pipeline. And, and so, you know, this whole series of events was going on that, you know, led to, to the accident, which of course was a, was a terrible thing. And um, what happened was actually 236,000 gallons of gasoline flowed out of the pipeline, found its way to Hannah Creek, which is a tributary to the main creek, Whatcom Creek. Um, started flowing down towards um, the downtown of Bellingham, and these two 10-year-old boys were turned out to be un unwitting heroes. Um, they were playing with the lighter, and they ignited this. Something else, if they hadn't ignited it when they did, it had would flow further downstream, and there would have been you know larger loss of life and property damage, I mean, it was horrible. And, and the third person killed the 18 year old fisherman who just graduated from high school, was fly fishing in the creek and was overcome by the fumes, 
fell into the river and drowned before the before the explosion of the uh, that happened. What was the fallout of the incident? Were there new regulations in Washington? Were there new regulations at the federal level? What, if anything, changed after this incident? So the parents of those kids became, you know, advocates for additional pipeline safety measures. And, and they traveled to Congress, testified many times, and a group formed in Bellingham that was initially called Safe Bellingham. Um, and they su kind of supported this effort and identified that at the federal level, the Office of Pipeline Safety, you know, not surprisingly understaffed, underfunded, not enough field inspectors. And so they helped um, get momentum into Congress and both in Washington state, both kind of Democratic and Republican uh, lawmakers were behind this, which obviously helps. And, and because of this tragedy, uh, tougher federal regulations were enacted and better state uh, oversight uh, came came into play too. Yeah, I was, I was actually on that response. I was a lowly boat driver for Clean Sound Cooperative at the time. I had just gotten, I lived in Bellingham. I lived on on H Street, not actually all that far from Whatcom Park. And when I got home, my pager went off, still, still wearing pagers at the time. And uh, I was instructed to, to, to get the uh, boom boat underway out of Squalicum Harbor and go boom off the mouth of Whatcom Creek. I had no idea why. I just, you know, that was it. And uh, I got down to the boat and I'm moving at this point. I, I hadn't turned to the Northeast. So this is all going on to my back and I'm moving SCBAs and air monitors and stuff uh, from the Western goal onto the Eagle. And uh, I'm standing up on the O1 one deck on the Western goal. And I turn around and look up and there's this giant plume of black smoke rising into the air. And I'm like, Oh God, I hope I'm not getting underway for that. But that's exactly what it was. We never did see any oil come out the bottom of the creek. It was speculated that uh, because of the firefighting foam, the Bellingham Fire Department used to put it out, it kind of acted like a dispersant. So we never really saw any sheen make it down the river. I don't know if that's, that's actually true or not, but I never saw any oil make it into Bellingham Bay. Yeah, and there it, there's a sewer pipe that actually runs across the creek just above Interstate 5, and it acts as a little bit of a dam. And, and actually, that's about as far as the fire went. However, you know, as you as you know, gasoline, not only it wants to evaporate, it, it, it'll also, you know, go into the water. And, you know, it the gasoline did reach the bay and it killed marine um, critters because th those were identified the, the next day on, on the beach. But yeah, as far as any, you know, there was not a big visible, you know, oil sheen uh, out on, on the bay. And, and again, because of the timing of, of you know, these uh, young boys igniting the gasoline, you know, it, it, it did save a much worse situation, even though it was, you know, a terrible tragedy, uh, what it did and it, it killed everything in the creek. I mean, it, it was devastating and it burned, you know, on both sides of the creek and it, but it only, it only destroyed one house, damaged a few buildings and other than the three deaths, I think eight people were treated from inhalation, kind of minor inhalation, smoke inhalation. I mean, it was really miraculous that there, there wasn't more uh, human and property damage. Another incident that you write about that I was also on was what has come to be called the Delco Passage incident. Um, I was at a training event when we got paged out and I got along with a co-worker of mine, Cam Houck, who's currently the MSRC supervisor in Tacoma, I've got the 
oil spill response vessel Grebe underway to head down towards the south end of Vashon Island. T tell us what happened uh, there and how that uh, response got started. So just a little bit as how ecology is, is operated for spill response. Ecology has four regions. Um, uh, in on Western Washington, we have a Northwest and Southwest and in the East side, we have a kind of central and Eastern. In each of those regions, we, we have two spill responders are on call, you know, after business hours, weekends and holidays. So in each region, there's going to be, you know, two spill responders on call, of course, with other support person people and managers available uh, that are always on call, so, so to speak. So in the middle of the night, our Southwest uh, was paged by the emergency management division. They get a lot of the calls. Um, a tugboat uh, captain was going through kind of uh, commencement bay area, kind of off, uh, kind of between... Browns Point and uh, Vashon and Maury Islands and claimed in the dark of night that he, he saw, you know, pretty good stretch of black oil. So that information was given and, and our on-call responder then, of course, connected with the Coast Guard. Uh, they discussed, uh, you know, what to do. And the decision between ecology and the Coast Guard was uh, we, we need to get a you know, a helicopter overflight at first light. We need to, to see because it was it was dark um, at the time. It was October, and so of course, weather wasn't cooperative. Thick fog couldn't couldn't fly. So, you know, as we're rolling in in the morning, you know, we we, well, we got to get things going. We got to get you know boats on the water. We got to get eyes on the water. So. We mobilized the Coast Guard, you know, got, I think, uh, National Response Corporation out. I had our boat uh, and our operator to meet with the Coast Guard um, pollution inspectors and, and to go out and try to see what, what was going on. And, you know, the boats that went out, they actually, yeah, we, we've got oil out here and, you know, it, it's kind of heavy and thick. And so... I had initially had uh, clean sound call them on standby. We we didn't nobody reported it, so we had a, a orphan or a mystery spill, and uh, you know I had said clean sound, you know, be ready, and and then we launched, you know, said yeah, we we got to go go, and that started the response, and then later in the day, as the fog lifted, then we got the helicopter. Uh, flights going and you know we could see well we got we got a bunch of oil um, it wasn't initially thought to be uh, crude oil and I'm, I'm a little I can't exactly remember what it was but and we have an excellent lab and at the time a chemist at the lab that could fingerprint uh, oil you know and and was looked on as a one of the nation's experts on that and finally you know when it went to the lab and came back and it's like well this is alaska you know north slope crude and that helped obviously with looking for suspect vessels because you know nobody reported it at the time and and through the coast guard and ecology identified some I don't know, 40 vessels that were potentially in the area but you know that narrowed it down and there had been an oil tanker that had uh been through there. Um, uh, I hope I don't mention kind of the polar Texas. I think it was, and uh, it was out of state. It had gone was it had dropped oil at uh, the U.S. oil in Tacoma, and then was headed back out. And and you know it was later determined, even though they never admitted it, never admitted it our vessel inspector from ecology and an investigation and the taking uh, photos of documents and stuff pretty much found that there, 
they had done a maneuver that at the time offered a likely pathway that, um, you know, oil could have uh, made it out of the, out of the vessel. And even though they never claimed responsibility, they ended up paying um, penalties and all the resource damage assessment. But at the time that, that wasn't, known until much later and the response went on as you you were a part of that uh no uh, did did what we could and and there was oil hit the beaches on the on vashon and and maury island and again global uh diving and salvage you know our excellent shoreline cleanup contractor did a great job and clean sound was out there we even had if you remember uh skimmers from oil skimmers from the u.s navy uh, came down um, and and managed that. Yeah, and this was uh this was an orphan spill, so there's no responsible party. So this was jointly managed between the United States Coast Guard and the Department of Ecology, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, command post was set up in Tacoma at the Tacoma Fire Department's Fire Training Center uh, in the Tide Flats. After we had a, I actually set up a, an initial forward command post with, we have a mobile uh, command post, a big RV, and I set up a helicopter landing zone at the Point Defiance, uh, above the Point Defiance boat launch, so we could get real-time, you know, information until the, the formal command post was set up uh, later that day. So you're actually uh, starting a new book. Right. Tell me about uh, what your decision process was, having written Constant Chaos, that made you decide to take another swing at it. Well, first, let me say why I wrote the first book um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I always felt that the, the job that we had was interesting that a lot of the general public just doesn't see the some of the big spills make the news and even some of the smaller ones but they're kind of blips and you know i always was amazed talking to even you know my family and friends about you know these incidents that i want you know it's like they had no idea had no idea the ecology spill responders cleaned up meth labs and you know that we also do hazmat uh, in addition to oil spills and just a variety of sometimes weird and bizarre things that that come down to us um so i thought you know it, it would be interesting to to write about some of these incidents and i looked around and i didn't really find any books like that there's a lot of books about individual incidents that go into detail but not the variety uh, and breadth of things. And I also thought it would be good to kind of document some of the bigger environmental disasters in the state, just like the Nistuck. I think, you know, they were critical in the formation of, of laws. Um, anyway, that was why I wrote that and, you know, hope I did a good job in making it, you know, factual and, and interesting. But one of the things after I wrote the book, I, I realized a number of these incidents, you know, it's so hard to get into all the detail and different layers involved that a number of the chapters I have in the book, you know, really could be books in of themselves. So I, I'm, I've started researching and, and doing some writing to take that uh, 1999 Olympic pipeline uh, incident and, and fully, uh, lay out the story all the different angles from the you know the the, the terrible uh tragedy of, of the kids dying and, and and the families and and you know what people in bellingham witnessed the 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 devastation of this creek that the community had been working on for years to restore salmon and other things and and there were some tremendous restoration projects that that came out of the result of, of that the whole environmental cleanup which is actually just about to be cleaned up or getting the final okay even to this day uh such the contamination around the where the pipe was 
And then, you know, obviously there was the the investigations that went into it, the NTSB uh, investigation going into the different causes and, and all that that I kind of touched on. And, and then, of course, there was the criminal investigation and, you know, and, and there was some jail time and, and consequences for some of the Olympic pipeline uh, uh, people. And then also the the good news that came out of it, all the, the strengthening of, of regulations on uh, kind of both gas and uh, hazardous liquid pipelines uh, across the country, which, of course, they're everywhere. And, and so, you know, trying to show the, the, the good that came out of that uh, terrible accident. Well, I look forward to it. And I do have uh, a stack of copies of Constant Chaos that I, I like to give them out when I hire new incident commanders for WISMIC when we're, you know, trying to make sure everybody's well grounded in the history of response in the state. So thank you for that. Ron Holcomb. Yeah, one, one, one of the other things I, I should have mentioned, um, motivation for writing the book when I, when I mentioned people don't, um, a lot of people don't understand, you know, even know about all the incidents, but also that how well prepared we really are, you know, in this state, um, and the coordination and cooperation that happens um, through both training and exercises, drills, and then just, you know, incidents that happen, you know, this is, it, it takes a, you know, it takes a community and it's, you know, f at the federal level, the state level, regional, you know, we work with uh, fire departments, police departments, multiple state and federal agencies and and coming together on these you know it under the incident command system that's used you know nationwide if not worldwide uh you know we are well positioned to 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 deal with uh incidents that do happen and i wanted to kind of hopefully that comes out in, in in the book i think it does and i thank you for writing it and i thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Everyone, Ron Holcomb's book, Constant Chaos. If you're in the oil spill response business or in the emergency response business, it's a good read. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's been a fun time.